Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. As we continue on in our study of Paul's first letter to Timothy. And as always, on behalf of Mark, Alice, and myself, we want to greet you in the wonderful, the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we're going to continue on. Last week we finished up and we were in chapter 6 in uh, verse 8. And as I said at the time, as we were closing, as we ran out of time, uh, I didn't I didn't complete the thoughts that I, I want to go through on that verse. So that's where we're going to pick up again, 1 Timothy 6, 8. But before we do that, Mark is going to ask for God's blessing on our time together. Lord, it says in your word where two or three people come together, you're you're in their midst. And Lord, we welcome you here and just guide this Bible study so we can hear from you. Amen. Amen. All right. As I say, we're in 1 Timothy 6, verse 8. By the way, those people had better be believers. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We are. Yeah, I know. I know. Praise God. Okay. 1 Timothy 6, 8 says, If we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. And we were talking about contentment last week as we ended, as I said. This is, this is so incredibly, incredibly important. You know, Paul talked about learning contentment, learning to be content with whatever situation you find yourself. Because there is, contentment is an incredibly, incredibly, no, let me rephrase that. Discontent is an incredibly, incredibly powerful force. Okay, mm -hmm. if you're discontent, it will drive you to all kinds of things because the flesh, the flesh longs for contentment. The flesh will never find it yeah. because it'll always be just out of out of reach. It'll be out of, but it drives the flesh. When you're content, you're not driven by that at all. You're not driven by those things. You have peace. You have peace. Mm -hmm. You have a, you often a peace that passes understanding. But if you're not content with what you have, whether we're talking about the possessions you have, the situations that you're in, you're going to you're going to be driven to try and change that. Mm -hmm. If you are con if you learn to be content, then you'll have peace. I, I it's an know. attitude, isn't it? Contentment is an attitude. Mm -hmm. I, it's it's your your you are at peace with what you have, whether, again, whether it's talking about possessions or situations, that you're okay with that, all right? Discontent means you're not okay with it. you got to, if it's talking about possessions, you've got to have more. You have to have more before you're going to be satisfied. And we talked about this. Jesus Christ had said in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Satisfaction, satisfaction and contentment go along together. If you're discontent, if you're dissatisfied, you're just going to be always struggling or striving. Grumbling and, gr and groaning and complaining to get what you don't have. Mm -hmm. What don't you have? If you have food and covering, with these we shall be content. This is the inspired word again. Right. It doesn't say if you have a brand new car, if you have a big house. It doesn't say if you have a great job. It just says if you have food and covering, if you have the basic needs of life met. Those are the things that should bring contentment into your life. Why? Stuff shouldn't change your contentment level. No, it, it should not. Yeah. Because you have an assurance right. that your needs will be met. Right. All right? Contentment has to do with desire. Okay, what do you desire? I mean, if you desire the world and the things of the world, let me tell you, first of all, because if you love the world and the things of the world, you have not the love of the Father within you. Right. But if it's the things of the world that you desire, you're going to be driven to try and get those things. If you are content in the Lord, you're not driven to go get those things because you know he'll provide what you need. Right. You don't have to strive. You don't have to struggle. You don't have to go through what the world goes through because God will supply all of your needs. Psalm 73, verse 25, and I may paraphrase here, it says that all we should desire is the Lord. He's all that we have, and he's all that we need. He's all we should desire. 
Are you looking for that? Is yeah, that what you're doing? Yeah. So, for whom have I in heaven but thee? And besides thee, I desire nothing on earth. That is a picture of perfect contentment. Mm -hmm. Okay? I desire nothing. There's nothing on this earth that I have a strong desire for. Okay? What I desire is spiritual. And the fact of the matter is I can be content. I can be at peace because God said he'll supply the things I need. He may not supply all the things that you desire if the things that you desire are the things of the world because they'll do you harm. The desire for them will do you harm. Absolutely. Right? So anything that you have beyond food and covering, the basic needs of life, is abundance. Right. Right? Abundance is simply having more than you need. Yes. It's abundance is not about having more than you you know that you want. It's about having more than you need. Uh, that, that's a basic lesson. I mean, I have to tell you, before I got saved, I I was always striving, always wanted more. I never had never had enough. I mean, I was one of the original yuppies. You know, I had a great job in Manhattan as a consultant in New York City. We had a lovely home out in the suburbs. I had the cars. I mean, I had a luxury car. I had sports cars. But it's like there's always something not there. There was always something missing in my life. And it was not until I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I found that thing that was missing in my life. And then for the first time in my life, I had peace and contentment. It's like this uh, black hole in the heart. It is. It just keeps sucking, sucking, sucking things in. Sucking, and it's never sucking, satisfied. It doesn't satisfy. The leech has two daughters, it says in Proverbs. <laughs> give, give. It's never satisfied. Right. You know, it's interesting. Uh, I've, I've mentioned this before. Alice and I spent a couple of years back in the, right around the turn of it was 1980, we spent a couple of years on the road traveling in a converted bus motorhome, just traveling wherever the Spirit of God led us. Because I had pastored a church in New York, in the suburbs of New York, and we left there, turned it over to a brother to, to serve as a pastor. And we went on the road, just led by the Spirit of God, going wherever He led. And the Lord, every place we went, we never had an itinerary. We never had a program. We would just pray and go. And every place we went, God would open doors. And we'd minister. We did that for two years. Absolutely. But it was interesting because now we're in Florida. But at that time, we had traveled to Florida. And uh, I had met, we had met, and I don't remember how, we, how this happened or what the occasion was. But on our travel, we met a young guy, probably my age at the time, who was an evangelist. He was a Spanish fellow, and he used to go around to different churches and, and minister. And he invited Alice and I to come over to his house, meet his wife, and just have some fellowship. Well, at the time, you know, as I say, we're tra constantly traveling, living in the bus. When we had an opportunity for fellowship like that, it was a real blessing. So, of course, you know, we, we welcomed that. So we went to his house, and we are having coffee and cake. His wife made cake for a very lovely couple. But as we sat there, he really began, he was complaining. He was mumbling and grumbling and groaning and complaining about how the offerings at the churches where he was going were so poor, where he wasn't just getting as much money as he thought he should be getting. And he was getting less and less. Than and he was going on and on and on and on. And I mean, I was ever so uncomfortable yes, just sitting there. It, it was uncomfortable. It was very, very uncomfortable. And I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, I heard a voice, an inner voice, that still small voice. And that still small voice that I know so well said to me, give him half of your abundance. God spoke to me and said, you give him half of your abundance. Now, I'm not being facetious. This is the way the conversation went on in my head. I said, Lord, have you looked in my pocket lately? Because I had a grant. We, we traveled by faith. We didn't have support. We didn't have that. We just went and trusted that God would supply our needs. What well, so happened that I had 20 cents in my pocket. And that was all the money we had. The thing was, we had we had fuel in the bus. It's filled up. Yep. We had plenty of food in the bus. Mm -hmm. So we're ready. We've got everything that we need. And God said to me, you have abundance. So I took the two dimes out of my pocket. And I put him on the table, and I slid one over to him, and I told him, God just told me to give you half of my abundance. And he began to cry. 
I mean, just he knew exactly what was going on. And it was such a moving moment because, you see, having more, having everything that we needed at the moment, that 20 cents represented abundance. It was 20 cents more than I needed. I didn't have need for anything at the moment. You understand what I'm saying? It was perfect peace. And I had a perfect peace about what was going on with the house tonight. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we needed a cup of coffee and a piece of cake, God had supplied it already as we sat there. It's interesting that that conversation went from uncomfortable to joyful. It did. Because he repented. That's right. That's the only reason. When I said that to him and I slid that time over, God spoke to him and he recognized exactly what was going on. Mm -hmm. And he repented of his discontent, of his grumbling, of his mumbling and groaning and complaining. So um, he learned a lesson that day. But I don't know he learned a better lesson than I did. Because, I mean, it shocked me when God said, give him half of your abundance. Because I just hadn't thought of it that way. No, we always think abundance as yeah. well, having a lot. A lot, yeah. Rabbi means teacher. Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, he's the teacher, but the two students needed to but, learn two different things. And you want to know something? But it was the same lesson. And I still need to learn. We all need to, always. as we, as long as we are on this planet, we need to continue to learn and grow in the Lord. Mm-hmm. So that, everything in our life, every experience in our life, should be a, a learning and growing experience. You know, Paul wrote to the Corinthians and he said, the natural man cannot accept the things of the Spirit of God because they're spiritually appraised. But we are to appraise all things. That means we're to praise all things spiritually. So when you start looking at everything in your life, all, all the events in your life, everything in your life, whether I'm talking about what's going on in your home, what's going on in your job, what's going on in the world around you, when you start to appraise those things spiritually, God will open your eyes to give you understanding. And you know what? We have revelation. God has revealed his plan to us from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. We need to seek understanding of his word. I know of what I speak. It's exciting yeah. when he gives understanding. You know, I, I, I don't mean to get off track, but this is not off track. I, I was thinking about that as I was praying today, and it struck me. I have an experience. Uh, I baked a cake one time. Yes, you did. Yes, he did. He, no, you didn't. You attempted no, to bake. Did. I baked, baked the cake. No, he baked it. I got the cake, baby. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He was sitting on the table waiting for me when now, I got it. Was it edible? <laughs> I Alice ate took it. a bite. <laughs> was it tongue? <laughs> okay. The, the thing is, and why I'm, I'm appraising that spiritually now, is the fact, and just, just the tiniest bit of background, I, my dad was in the hotel business. I grew up in hotels to begin with. Mm-hmm. My mother was a child from, she came from a big Irish Catholic family. She was a middle girl. She wasn't the oldest daughter. She wasn't the youngest daughter. And it so happened that it was normal in that kind of family that they would learn how to cook from going in and it was your turn to learn to cook. Yeah, well, it's kind of skipped her. Yeah, yeah, she never so did. my mother, as a young girl just growing up, didn't learn how to cook. Yeah. And she married my father. We lived in hotels and they ate in restaurants. They ate in a hotel restaurant. So my to. mother didn't cook. Yeah. Then when she finally tried, well, it was disastrous. It was, uh, yeah, it was, it was a little bit of I Love Lucy show, yeah. But that's so. so, so you got that from her. So huh? I, yeah, I got that. That's my. That's in my DNA from my mother. <laughs> but I decided one day that I was going to bake a cake. Mm-hmm. I was going to bake a cake for Alice. She wasn't home. I was. So Alice th- at the time didn't, didn't bake play. either. She's a wonderful cook, but didn't bake. I didn't like baking, so I didn't. So I decided, and I went to the store. I went to the grocery store. And I'm going to go buy, I bought all the ingredients I needed. I bought a cake mix. And of course, we didn't have the, the baking utensils, the, the cake pan or anything. So I bought all of that. I bought a cake pan. I bought a good one, you know, with the space age plastic top on it, the whole deal. And I went back and I figured I am a very literal person, which has served me well in the word. Yes. Didn't necessarily serve me well that day because it started off and it said, you know, I took the cake mix and I put it in a thingy thingy is the, the technical term and then it said well add two egg whites bowl. <laughs> it said add two egg whites now i am not a stupid person no, you are not and i am a very literal person so i picked up an egg and there are three parts to an egg there is the yellow part the yolk there is the clear part and that is in clay, enclosed in a white, white shell. shell i knew I figured it out logically that I wasn't supposed to put the shell in there. 
Because that's not edible. No. But that's the only white part. That's right. Until I fried the egg. That's right. Then I had some white part. You had egg whites. I had egg whites now. So I put the egg. Well, I'll just tell you, it went from there and, and got Downhill. worse. That was the successful part. That Yeah, that was. So anyhow, I, I baked this cake. I mentioned that I bought this space age plastic thing. I put it, when I finally got it all mixed up, I put it in this cake pan and I put it, I preheated the oven. I mean, I followed the instructions. Great. I put it in, I preheated the oven, I put it in the oven, I put this plastic top on. Plastic melts. Yes, it does. On heat. I thought it was space age plastic. It wouldn't melt. It melted, yeah. It did. You thought it was oven proof. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm not well, tell you me. also made some substitutions. Well, I'm not going to go through the whole yeah. story, but I will tell you this. When Alice came home, I greeted her at the door. It was and, an accident. And I said it was an accident. <laughs> so. She, wonderful wife that she is, she actually tried to yes, buy it. She tried a bit of it. The point that I'm going to make, though, is I followed the instructions to the best as I could, literally. Yes. You can have knowledge without understanding and make a mess, mm. which is exactly where I was. I knew what it said. I, it said put two, two egg whites in. I I saw the instruction and I did it. I just didn't understand what it meant. Right. Why didn't they say put the ear the egg clear in there? <laughs> it's their fault. Duncan Hines, I'm going to get you something. Okay, it's got to be that way with the word. Yes, we have to be literal, but you know what? We need to pray for understanding because if you try and do the word without understanding, you're going to bake up a mess. And I'm telling you the truth. So when it comes to this, this contentment, this whole issue, we need to learn from the word of God and pray for understanding. God is not trying to, when God says, I'll give you everything you need, but if you have food and covering, that's enough. We have to get understanding that indeed that is enough, that we can be pleased, we can be fully satisfied with nothing. I, 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 I said my dad was in the hotel business. My first memories are from one of the most posh hotels in New York City where we lived. I mean, I had next door neighbors who were very, very wealthy, very, very famous people. I've had the opportunity in my life to know a lot of wealthy people. I've known a lot of poor people who were happier than many of those yes. wealthy people that I knew. People, and we're going to get into that, people trust in wealth to make them content and give them happiness. You don't understand. Okay. Okay, let me go on now. Verse 9 and 10. I want to read 9 and 10. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Mm. Those who want to get rich. You know, in the parable of the sower and the seed, Jesus warned us. This is Matthew 13, 22. He said, and the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns. This is the man who hears the word and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. The, the, the deceitfulness of riches is nothing more than that lying devil who is worshipped in the world as mammon. A lot of people don't get that, right? Speaking to you, trying to seduce you from the path of righteousness. His desire is written for us to see. Satan comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. John 10.10. 10. You know, I, I've shared this with, with Mark before. Alice and I had the occasion, we, we knew a lot of wealthy Christians, uh, when I had started uh, a couple of Christian businesses, mm -hmm. and we had occasion to meet with a, a, I don't know, half dozen guys have, for a lunch meeting in Sarasota, Florida, at the Country Club. Uh, and one of the fellows is, I mean, really, really well known. He's written quite a number of books on Christians and finances. He's a brilliant guy when it comes to Christians and finances. He's done consulting work with churches all over the United States. So he was sitting next to, to me and Alice, and we were having lunch. And in the conversation, 
Um, he, 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 he said that money talks. Yeah, he, he, made, he said that with a common expression. He said money talks, or the world says money talks. Mm-hmm. That's what he said. The world says money talks. I said, I know. I, Jesus said the same thing. Well, that stopped the conversation around the table for a minute. And people said, what do you mean that Jesus said that money talks? I said, he did. He said that it talks. He just said that it lies. That's right. Beware the deceitfulness of riches. I'm going to tell you what. You put money in front of people, it says it'll it'll start lies, screaming at most lies, of them. Lies, and it'll tell you. Bet you that was a forehead slapping moment. Well, it is. Because. <clears throat> but you it's just like, it. ow. <laughs> it's so true. Money talks. Mm-hmm. But it lies. Because it's going to promise you all the things that it can do for you. Mm-hmm. It's going to promise how it can take care of you. You know, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said no man can serve God and mammon. The truth is, money will never serve you. When you have that greed, you'll be serving the money all the time. You'll be a slave to it. So we we need to understand that because everything in the world around us is focused on making us believe that money is the answer to every situation, every problem, every every human condition is wrong. Money can fix it. It cannot. And, it, you know, this topic is so important because when it comes to greed, covenant, covetedness, as, as Paul wrote in his letter to the Colossians, it's idolatry. That's what it is. Greed is idolatry. Silver and gold. Remember Peter mm-hmm. and John going up the steps of the, to the temple the and the beggar was there? And Peter said to him, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give to you. Peter had something far better than silver and gold. And he touched that man's life. God used him to touch that man's life in a life-changing way that money never could have done. Never could have done. We're so focused on money. Focus, fix your eyes on Jesus Christ, the author, the finisher, the perfecter of your faith. And you will find out what true happiness, true contentment is and where it comes from. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, Mm -hmm. but is from the world. 1 John 2, 15 and 16. We live in a world, and I've said this a number of times in this study, we live in a world where it is filled with propaganda. Every time you turn on a radio, every time you turn on a television, every time you drive down the street and see a billboard, that is propaganda trying to incite you to desire, to desire that new car, to desire that. It's all about that, trying to stir that up in you. And they set out in the 1950s to do just this. They Well, they they formalized it and they really perfected it. Now, I mean, this has been around a long time. Remember, Jesus in the wilderness mm-hmm. was tempted by the devil. Yes, he was. Who's yeah. trying to tell him, you know, you can have all of this. Or you can have all this, all, the, all these glories of the world. You can have that. Just bow down to me. It's been around a long time. But he has refined it throughout the time. He has, especially in his use against human people like us. All right? It's just... and But I didn't say it becomes a God. When you think that money is the answer to your problems. You have forgotten what the Psalm says, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. Okay? He is your savior. He is the one that can fix your problem. He is the one that can heal your soul. He is the one that can do all the things that you need. Money is the root of all sorts of evil. I've seen it over and over and over in the business world. I said, I was a consultant in the business world. I had an advertising agency. I know what I'm talking about when it comes to advertising because I was on the wrong side of that a long time ago. But I've seen all of a sudden where some, you know, people start a small business and all of a sudden that business starts to really grow. You know what you see? It's called gold fever. The dollar signs in the eyes. Everything changes. Everything changes. It's all about that gold fever because we are so conditioned by the world to think that money... Why do you think of the lottery? Let me just tell you, when I was a young man, there was a lottery here in the United States. It was called the numbers racket. Mm -hmm. And it was against the law. All right? 
And then the government said, well, wait a minute, we're missing out. Yeah. So the government became involved, and they basically put the mafia out of the numbers business because the government runs all of these lotteries. That's right. That's all it is. Why do you think that's so successful? Because people look at the numbers, and all of a sudden, I mean, the, the machine starts to rule, and they have, what would I do if I had that kind of money? What would you do? It's incredible how, how studies have shown that so many people who have gotten the money, it didn't do anything good for them in the long run, all right? It reminds me of what it says in Proverbs 23, verses 4 and 5. Do not weary yourself to gain wealth. Cease from your consideration of it. When you set your eyes on it, it is gone. For wealth certainly makes itself wings, like an eagle that flies toward the heavens. Amen. It's, yeah. it's gone. And that's what happened with all these people in the lottery. Well, you know, we just both watched the film, All all the Money in the World. Yeah, we talked about that last and week. And yeah. they didn't get to keep it. I mean, billions of dollars gone, <clears throat> evaporated in a generation or two. Well, even when they have the money. And, and I got to tell you, it's about this loss. I, I was talking to Alice a little while ago. I had um, a consulting business. And I, one of my clients, who we lived in Naples, Florida at the time, was a, an incredibly wealthy man. I mean, a multi, 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 multi millionaire, right? And he asked me to bring my vice president. I, you know, I was president of a company, and he asked me if I would, if I would, and my my vice president fly was, with him out to programmer, a great programmer, programmer, great, great yeah. programmer. <clears throat> he said, "Would you come out to my uh, West Coast headquarters in Sacramento, California?" And look at some things for me. So I said, sure. So he said, okay, we'll fly out on my Lear. So he has a Lear jet. Now, interestingly, that was what he had in Naples because they wouldn't allow anything bigger in the airport there. He also happened to have a custom 737 over in West Palm. But he figured the Lear would do for us to just to zip back and forth across country. So I spent five hours with him one way, six hours with him the other way. He and I in his Lear jet, you know, and we're sitting having conversations and everything. I'm telling you the truth when I say to you that for, for five hours one way, six hours the other way, all this man did was complain about the deals that he had missed. I mean, he had he was rich beyond most people's conception. I mean, and yet all he talked about was what he didn't have. You know what that is? That's a definition of malcontent. Striving. It doesn't matter what you have. You're just not, you're just not content because you want more. One more, more. Contentment is being satisfied with what you have. What do I have? You chase I them. have the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. I have a God who supplies all my needs. What more do I need than that? I, I don't know. Nothing. I have food and covering. Paul said that he had learned to be content, right? Okay. I can't believe we've run out of time already and I didn't get past that verse. Shame on me. Well. We thought it was going to end tonight. Huh? Yeah, well, it didn't end tonight. <laughs> the, the thing is, please seek God and understand that God wants you to be content. He came that you would have joy and that your joy would be made full. He came that you would have life and have it abundantly. And he said, but he still said, he said, even when a man has abundance, his life doesn't consist of his possessions. It's not about the stuff. Mm. It's about the peace in your heart. And it's about the assurance that you have, that you have a loving father who loves you so much that there's no good thing he would withhold from you. If you don't believe that, look at the cross of Jesus Christ. So, Father, we do. We just praise you and thank you. Lord, help us to truly live that word. Help us true to be free from the love of money. Help us to be free that we might serve you in truth and in spirit, Lord God. We don't want to be driven by anything but our relationship with you. We trust in you. We trust in your word. We trust you, Father, because you have demonstrated your love in Jesus Christ. Well, Praise until God. next time, God bless you and goodbye. Be joy-filled. Be filled with the joy, the love, the love, the peace of the Lord. It's called the fruit of the Holy Spirit. God bless you.
มาย